everybody, let me show you something. Okay, watch this and watch it carefully. There it is. <laughs> so, I don't know if you noticed what it did. What it did was wobble. But it did something more than wobble. It actually wobbled and rotated at the same time. When something wobbles, well, it just wobbles. When something wobbles and rotates, it's called mutation. And it's very different from wobbling. You can find motors, actually, that are just based on wobbling. And this is an example of where it just wobbles. There's no rotation. And you can see that because there's a great big slice through the middle of the disc preventing it rotating. And so all it can do is wobble. And this has been used as things like a pump and a motor and a meter. And the animation is from Thang 010146. And I'll put a link to that in the bottom of this description. So that combination of wobbling and rotation was probably noticed by an Australian chap called Peter Davidson who brought out a patent in 1973. And you might ask yourself, well, why bother? Well, if you can combine those two, you can make it more than a motor, you can make it a gear train. And gear trains are incredibly important, particularly around that time, and probably because of these things. These things have a, a very low power motor, actually, but it does spin at a 10,000 to 12,000 RPM. So if we can get a gear train in there that steps that speed right down, we can step the torque right up. And of course, that's exactly what they did. And these really took off and became super important to everybody and perhaps one of the indispensable tools to have. Because in here is a motor and a gearbox. And that gearbox is typically a planetary gear train and of course everything can be made better if you put your thought to it and if you can make that planetary gear train of less components but more efficient well you've got a winner on your hand and that's exactly what Peter Davidson did he took that idea of mutation using bevel gears turned it into a reduction gear and here's what I drew up in Tinkercad. Of course, I'll put these files on Thingiverse, should anybody be interested in them. But the heart of this system are four bevel gears. Actually, it looks like there's three. But the cream bevel gear gets printed twice, and then at the ends. The core of it is the blue bevel gear and the green bevel gear, and they differ by one tooth. If you look, there's an orange axle with a barrel in the centre that's offset by 10 degrees, because in the mutating drive, the mutating gear system, it's not only the number of teeth that change the ratio. In the spur gear, of course, it all depends on the number of teeth. In a mutating gear, it depends on the number of teeth and the angle of mutation. That is, how far I've offset that barrel. Typically, it's between 0 and 5 degrees, but I've made it 10. And when we printed them off, this is what we get. Now these two with the six holes in them are the start and finish, and these two go back together. So take one of these and the short spacer, the short spacer stuffs in there so that it's level with that, and then that whole thing gets stuffed in there, and it should be fixed. So that it's like that. Now, if it isn't a stiff fit, and this is a stiff fit, then a little bit of super glue will make sure that that stays fixed. For the second one, we take the longer of the spaces, again that gets stuffed in there so that it's level with that, and then this whole thing should just slot in there, but be free to turn. So it's like that. So it's fixed to this bit, again a bit of super glue, but free to turn in there. So these two bevel gears that have the four holes in them differ by one tooth. That's got 41 in it, I've written on it, and that one's got 42 on it. And they go back to back with these pinholes lining up. And for that, there are a couple of pins that slot through the holes. And again, a little bit of glue to keep them fixed to each other. Okay, so when you've done that, take the axle and you'll actually find two of these. One of them glues on here like that. I might redesign this a little bit actually, I thought this would be easier this way. But you then take this, this with the 42 teeth pointing in that direction along this part of the spindle, not the straight one, that part. Slide it on. 
because that bit is the bit will, that will face the fixed end and that needs to be free to rotate which is what that does it keeps it free to rotate but slots it sliding off and then carefully glue that next one onto there to hold this in place but still leaving it free to spin we've done that we can slide it into the fixed end like that then the handle stop goes on like that then on with the handle and then on this one we can put the floating end into there and again glue that in place okay that's it now I put a dot right there and if I give this handle one full turn you'll see how far that dot moves and it's not very far it's about 1 40th so we've got a 40 to 1 gear ratio in our mutating gear okay let's give that a few spins So pretty cool, if you ask me. Now, remember this was invented in 1973 and the patent ran out a few years ago. But if you take one of these apart, what you'll still find are planetary gear systems. This is supposed to be cheaper to make. It's supposed to be more compact, less parts. The forces are more evenly spread, so the materials can be cheaper and lighter. And you have to ask yourself, why isn't it that this is not now dominating this market? Well, actually there's very good reasons for that. People often think that build a better mousetrap and folk will come rushing. Now, very often that isn't the way it is. What very often happens is other things have a priority. I mean, the thing about a planet and sun and planet gear is it's had years of history. This thing is a bit of an unknown. So if you went for this and it didn't work, it broke or wore out more quickly, could really be a lot of money. And so staying with something that you know is conservative with a small c, but can be a better decision sometimes. Sometimes not, sometimes yes. And then of course there's all the manufacturing that needs to be go into something. Product lines take a lot of money to set up and changing them isn't gonna happen overnight. So better mousetraps don't always make you a fortune. Sometimes they get relegated to obscurity. And it's why I keep going back on things, because very often there are things that have been relegated to obscurity that are in fact solutions to our problems now. It's just we forgot about them. This one, it is pretty awesome. It's pretty wonderful and very interesting. I don't know if it'll ever appear in anything. Maybe it too will just be forgotten until some future date when it finds an application. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching, and please do remember to like and subscribe.